Welcome to the fifth session. May I invite you to come back in and join. You can bring your coffee and we are up for an interesting session. We will, we will discuss the challenges of and the lessons learned from the pandemic. We've already learned this morning that COVID is a major driver of sepsis on the one hand. On the other hand, the pandemic showed problems in health services which were pre-existent, but it provided new solutions as well. And some of these solutions might be helpful in sepsis. This is the topic of our session. My name is Volker Wildermuth. I'm a German science journalist working for the public radio here. And we'll start off with short perspectives of our distinguished speakers here on the podium, which have different angles to look at the pandemic and at sepsis as well. And first in line will be Professor Rudi Eggers. You've already met him on the session before. He's director of integrated health service at the WHO, and he looks at sepsis and COVID from the perspective of the basic health infrastructure. Please. Well, thank you again. Uh, as I said, I was here earlier. So we've heard from uh, the perspective of clinicians, of researchers. Um, we've also heard of the perspective of families and individuals that have been affected by, by sepsis. And now perhaps I can bring the perspective from the public health uh, side of things. So from WHO, we'd like to place the sepsis agenda also into a global context. So that will be my first point. And then my second point, just what WHO is doing in terms of the sepsis agenda. So we've already heard that, of course, the final common pathways for many diseases, many complicated diseases, is sepsis, and we've heard huge numbers. And that is something, of course, that we hear about a lot in hospitals. But of course, we know that sepsis occurs and starts off in communities and in those primary care facilities, and perhaps in family practice as well. So just like we need competent hospitals, we need competent critical care nurses and physicians, we also need very competent community and primary care engagers. In this setting, we find that just common hygiene practices, common infection prevention and control procedures, and systematizing the engagement, both the diagnosis and the management, is of critical and equal importance. We know that, or we've heard today, approximately one-fifth of all global uh, deaths have sepsis as a cause or a contributing factor. And too many people are still dying of sepsis as a consequence of something that started very small, like we heard this morning, a scratch on the elbow. Only half of the sepsis survivors, of course, will fully recover. And those that do not recover, one out of three will die uh, within a year. And this is data that's quite similar to what was presented by the Jena University earlier. But let's think also about the community setting. The lack of clean water, adequate sanitation, and hygiene practices very often is a contributing factor to microbial transmission and as such a preventable cause of sepsis. Just recently there was a WHO report uh, that is greatly concerning. It showed that 3.8 billion people do not have access to basic hygienic services in their health care, including 688 million people that receive health care in facilities that have no uh, hygienic measures whatsoever. Similarly, 22% of global health facilities do not have basic water services. There's no running water. They cannot wash their hands. That means about 1.7 billion people are accessing health services where there's no running water. A huge problem, and that's also a huge problem for sepsis. So in addition to those facility-based uh, services that we talk about in sepsis, we also need to consider just basic improvements of water, sanitation, 
hygiene. And these, on a global scale, will actually Im impact dramatically on things such as sepsis. So that's my first pitch. My second pitch, I'd like to mention the WHO work that has been done on sepsis just recently. And that's beyond the COVID-driven agenda. There were, of course, a lot of guidelines that were produced in the COVID period that deal with sepsis. So in, in addition to that, of course, we have greatly invested in additional guidelines and courses, training courses from WHO. In more than 30 countries, we are rolling out emergency and critical care training and process tools to improve the recognition, prioritization, and uh, uh, care of acutely ill patients. And I'm just going to name a couple of courses. There's the WHO ICRC Basic Emergency Care Course, which supports early recognition and intervention of sepsis. This has been taught to a thousand more frontline workers and currently is developed by the WHO Academy as one of the first batches of high priority courses. Secondly, there's the interagency integrated tri triage tool, which facilitates early recognitions of signs and symptoms of sepsis, in which has been rolled out to support the identification and prioritization in a time sensitive manner. We've got a team that looks at emergency and critical care in a broader sense. Of course, that also covers sepsis, but in a broader sense, it looks at critical care more broadly. And this will be uh, resulting in a course in the World Health uh, uh, WHO Academy course on primary care, which will include this support to the first contact providers to more effectively diagnose and manage sepsis. Finally, all of these tools will be brought together in some uh, sepsis toolkits that would enable countries to actually take up the toolkit and start training their own health workers so that in a less resource endowed country, maybe in Africa, maybe in Asia, these trainings can also take place to assure that this uh, early recognition and the initial response is correct. So thank you for allowing WHO to speak on this part. Yeah, thank you. Now we've learned a lot about the importance of primary care. We switch to our next speaker, with his, which is Professor Axel Pries. He's a specialist for cardiovascular health and research. And most of all, he's the dean of the world-known hospital Charité here in Berlin, which is a high-end hospital and delivered critical care to patients with COVID and, of course, for patients with sepsis. Thank you. Very much for giving me the uh, chance to talk about it. Um, it's only a nickel I can add to the discussion here because uh, the room is full with experts on, on this topic. I come from microcirculation actually and uh, I think the microcirculation and the phenomena um, in the microcirculation play a big role but uh, it's also typical that that quite a few of these phenomena are not yet really mastered and that appeared to me when I uh, looked a little bit into current definitions, and if you say it's a dysregulated uh, immune response which is causing, uh, or we, which is actually sepsis, sepsis uh, and then you look into diagnosis and uh, treatment options, they are pretty much, uh, if you would say, conventional in this context, and, and there is no real translation of, of the new definition of the sepsis mechanism into uh, either diagnosis or therapy. There is no proper immune modulation therapy, um, nothing which is addressing the interleukins or the uh, white blood cells. But that's the scientific part, and I'm, I'm, I'm not at all an expert in this area. But I think it also links a little bit to why we don't focus enough on sepsis. There are um, people, and that's quite clear and also a message from, from the COVID crisis that people um, <clears throat> judge um, danger not according to the real amount of threat in terms of numbers of people are dying. They, they relate it to themselves and whether they can understand the threat or the enemy and, and the reactions. 
and uh, with with COVID, that uh, led after a while to a pretty um, pretty strong immune reaction of of the societies and the population. Whereas with sepsis, I think we are in an immune um, suppressed state. Um, I, I would say that in in our curriculum, sepsis doesn't play a role which is at all commensurate to the um, to, to the disease burden. Um, and that's also reflected in, I think, in science and, and research, because otherwise we might be already at a stage where we can deliver a more focused immune modulation therapy, which certainly needs to address individual sepsis cases very differently, because you have a large variety between people, but also within a single person, and we also learned that from COVID that the immune response state, whether it's a hyperimmune or, or hypoimmune state, is changing over time. So you would need to know much more about it. And we are not just not doing enough research to, to do it. Okay, other lessons from, from, from the COVID crisis. Um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> when COVID came about, it was quite clear that... Uh, the scientific field, also the um, industry field, did react much faster and much more focused as compared to the political field. We, uh, when, when COVID came, we, we had a global crisis and we had national uh, bordering to nationalistic responses. Like, like in the beginning saying we don't export X and Y to our even in Europe, to our European partners, uh, um, and that's uh, ridiculous in a global threat and also ridiculous according to global supply chains. Whereas, on the other hand, in, in the scientific field, I had the impression both within the Charité, but also within uh, Germany and, and also internationally, that the cooperation was very, very focused. And we switched from... Uh, competition to cooperation. And that's something which I think we could also learn for, for sepsis. Because we are all trained, and it was in the talk in, in the previous round, we are all trained, maybe it's a tribal uh, background, but it's also the scientific reality of every day. You are trained to beat your, uh, your peer in terms of writing a better grant application, coming up with a better paper, and so on and so forth. And in in tackling a, a real threat, that doesn't help. It's good to have different ideas and to pick the best idea, but then you have to work together, let's say, make a trial. If everyone does his own or her own trial, it, uh, every one of these trials is worth nothing. And that's also true in, in Germany. We, we, uh, at Charity, we created a, um, a COVID research board where people were working together in unprecedented ways. Also, I found that 90% uh, of every uh, of, of all scientists at Charity were actually uh, virologists or at least COVID researchers, which was a new finding for me as a dean. Um, but it shows how agile research is. So the researchers uh, said, this is a very big question. We have to address this, and we have to do it together. And I think that's something which which really should, should be learned for, for, um, <clears throat> for sepsis. And the other thing is make sep sepsis more understandable to everyone so we can include it more effectively in our curriculum and in, also in the public notion. Because uh, even after my medical study, for me it was kind of an enigma uh, what it actually is. Thank you. Thank you. We are lucky we have a communication specialist with us, Joachim Müller-Jung. He is a science journalist in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and the Frankfurter Sonntagszeitung. He had the science department there for many years and in the COVID pandemic reached a much wider audience with in-depth coverage, but on the other hand had to debunk a lot of fake news as well. So what is your take? Yes, thank you very much. Um, nice uh, that you just mentioned the, the uh, cooperation. Uh, I just uh, read yesterday the 57-page-long the uh, uh, review in the, from the Lancet Commission, 
which, uh, which mentioned a lot of failures, uh, big failures, uh, in, especially in medicine and science. And one, one of those is the, the operational coordina coordination of international research and the cooperation. So uh, maybe it's exceptional. Of course, I know the situation in, in, in the charity is exceptional case, uh, and maybe there's international, uh, uh, international there, there have been different cases. Uh, that would be very um, helpful to um, yeah, to discuss those those failures uh, which are which are documented by by Lancet. But but I don't want to talk about uh, cooperation or the the scientific failures or or the cooperational failures. I want to talk. I want to 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 talk about about trust and the importance of trust. And you mentioned the communication aspect. And and I heard a lot uh, about uh, the vocabulary. Uh, the sepsis, this word sepsis, which is for most people an abstract uh, vocabulary, uh, and it is still for, for most people. And I, I, I investigated in my own archive, also in, in our own archive in the newspaper, and, and I was very astonished that uh, we have 170 uh, magazines, newspapers, and so on. Uh, documented there, we have a really big uh, documentary, uh, and um, in the last ten years, just just to mention this, in the last ten years we had seven, we had uh, six hundred hits for sepsis, and eight hundred, around about eight hundred for Blutvergiftung, which is the same in Germany as sepsis. Uh, so six hundred in ten years, for HIV we have the tenfold, we have uh, six to seven thousand. And uh, concerning cancer, we have 24 to 25,000 hits, just uh, documented by the, the 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 newspapers and magazines and uh, the, the popular uh, the popular um, yeah media. So uh, this is a failure, of course, of us, uh, and we have a responsibility. Uh, uh, we but uh, this is uh, just one aspect. Uh, we are just one part of this communication uh, of this communication network which we have to build and uh, the covid crisis i mean is one example where we can see how it should work and how it shouldn't also work and trust is the main part uh, is a, is a main issue uh, because we are confronted as journalists and of course as citizens also and of course as physicians and so, a lot of physicians were misinformed, were disinformed, and they use misinformation because they don't know better. And they should, they should, of course. Uh, so uh, I, ha I was uh, part of a presentation last week uh, here in Berlin, uh, a survey which is, uh, um, which is um, done by Alsevier and Kerber Stiftung. It is realized by uh, economic impact, and it's not it's not uh, published so far, so I cannot use uh, the the exact numbers. But of course, it was very interesting. It will be published uh, during falling walls here in Berlin. Uh, but there is a survey in different countries, and we discussed this this or the the questions were about trust uh, during the COVID crisis, and we discussed that uh, with the researchers and the investigators and uh, it was very interesting to, to, to hear uh, that a lot of young researchers which took part in, in this survey, a lot of young researchers are interested in doing communication. They didn't do that so far before COVID but they now try to do and a lot of them, a lot of the, the, uh, the, uh, the young researchers which were asked, yeah, they were very open it's about one third to one, one fourth to one third, and 60%, so two thirds agree that there should be more awareness. And why is that? Because, because they have the issue, they have the, the, the problem um, of, um, yeah, missing trust. They, 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 no, they, they noticed that there is a lot of misinformation uh, in the public and they 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 think they should they should uh, correct that 
and for themselves. And about half of the people, uh, uh, half of the researchers which were asked, um, uh, uh, answered that uh, they, they want to have more training, uh, communications training. And so for me, it was a very, it was a very interesting uh, result because this is a sign that a lot of researchers are really, uh, they, they accept and they, they are really prepared to, to communicate and uh, to, to counterfy these uh, misinformations and fake news which, were, which we were confronted uh, during COVID. And that's really, this is a war, this is a war of fake news and we should, we should present the public targeted information and it's not just targeted information by scientists or science writer, it is targeted information, good information, uh, trusted information by researchers. A lot of these fake news are um, focused on vaccines and vaccines on the other hand were a major impact, have a major impact on the uh, COVID pandemic. So with us is Professor Stefan Kaufmann. He's a vaccine developer and researcher. He's director emeritus at two Max Planck Institutes for Infection Biology here in Berlin and multidisciplinary sciences in Göttingen. What is your take? Yes, thank you. Um, it's, um, it's an interesting question, actually. I uh, wanted to say a few things which already Axel Pries has covered on research, but I come back to that. So I think that indeed COVID-19 has changed the world. First, it has shown to those amongst us who thought uh, infectious diseases are over, are a matter of the past. No, they are not a matter of the past. They are, pa they are a matter of past, present, and future. And the second thing, and now we come to vaccines, vaccines can be game changers. And I mean here, Met, uh, research development and therefore science also can contribute and can be a game changer, for example, through vaccines. Now, I think we have to learn the lessons now for the future. And um, I think the area of emerging viral infections are well taken. I mean, nothing is optimal, but at least they are quite well taken. But then there are the unbeaten threats, as I would like to call them, the diseases including TB, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, hepatitis C. And I'm a worker in the area of tuberculosis and we have a vaccine uh, that's now in several phase three trials and I'm very optimistic. The issue is this took us some decades. Now you can say you are more stupid or you didn't do it with all the engagement, but I will come back to that and tell you why this is um, more complex and that's also important if we consider vaccines actually for certain types or agents that cause sepsis. And the last point I think also is that we have to be clear, and that has been discussed here enormously, and I'm very uh, glad to see that, and that's the bad bugs. Those uh, bugs or those agents that are antimicrobial resistant, which is an increasing issue for many, many diseases. I understand we don't die of AMR, but obviously we die because these bugs are AMR, they are resistant. Now, we all agree, and I don't need to say that and reiterate that, sepsis clearly is a major threat, perhaps even the threat. It belongs to those uh, unbeaten and sometimes almost forgotten, I talk about the public, um, and AMR really is devastating for that. So could we get vaccines against, um, could we get vaccines against sepsis? I think there is a way, and I think that the president of the, um, uh, of the uh, uh, rapid development of vaccines against coronavirus is uh, given a good example. The issue is that there is a plethora of pathogens, so we cannot have one target, we have many targets, and these pathogens use very, very different mechanisms to succeed in the host. And second, obviously, that um, we need a more complex array of vaccines. COVID-19, and I say that with the enormous respect to what has happened, but still was an easy way for vaccine developers. 
one agent, one antigen that's protective and therefore one type of immunity neutralizing antibodies are a major player, not the only one, but still. TB, my field, is more complex. There you have a kind of a very fine-tuned balance of immune responses, notably the white blood cells, the T cells. And sepsis is even more complicated. It's many agents, many disease-causing um, agents, many mechanisms underlying and very different mechanisms. So clearly one size will not fit all of those. But still, I think, and pneumonia, pneumococcus vaccines have shown it can be done. COVID-19, if you count those as a major driver of sepsis as well, um, and I don't want to discuss that now, but uh, also showed it can work. More complex ones are there, but even if you get only a couple of vaccines, that could be a game changer. That's the active vaccination. If I may just say, there's another way of vaccination that Axel Pries also mentioned that I would call it host-directed therapy. That is an approach that's very, very complex. We learn from many diseases, there are different endotypes, infectious diseases, those who hyper-respond, those who show hypo-responses. And similarly, this is clearly a, a major point in sepsis. So we need biomarkers that tell us which endotype these individuals are, and then also go with. So in sum, I think it is worth to consider vaccine development, both active and passive vaccination, including host-directed therapy for sepsis. And I think the major issue we have to see is vaccines, science can be game changers, and clearly COVID also tells us it's a matter of financial support. The financial support for COVID-19 was enormous, that's good, but we cannot live now with a kind of now the money has been used up and we cannot go on and uh, provide more money. The answer is yes, we need. And I would like to end with a sentence of Mar Mary Lesker, you know the Lesker Prize. If you think research is expensive, try disease, I couldn't um, argue against that. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot of the possible vaccines would have to be used in Africa. And we have with us the chair of the African Sepsis Alliance, Professor Emmanuel Zutibu. He is an infection specialist working at the Sheikh Makboud Medical City in Abu Dhabi. Tell us about Africa and we need the um, PowerPoint presentation now. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak. It's a pleasure to be here. And so I'm going to be talking about the perspective from Africa and also from the Eastern Mediterranean um, area. Um, so I'm the chair of the African Sepsis Alliance, so I'll be bringing the experience of the work we're doing from the African Sepsis Alliance, but also as an infectious disease physician working in the Middle East, in the United Arab Emirates, also the perspective of UAE and, and other countries in the, in the Middle East. So these regions are pretty different, and that's the first thing. It's really two very different regions, but there are lessons um, from these two regions. The first is Africa has the youngest population in the world. So 60% of the population under the age of 25. So it's really a young population. And compared to the, the Middle East, um, still a younger population com compared to Europe, but not, as, not uh, as much as in Africa. Also, relatively speaking, um, in Africa, relatively less resources, often described as mismanaged resources, not less resources, but there's a real problem with lack of funding in the healthcare system um, as, com as compared to the Middle East. So one estimate, for example, with respect to access to ventilators, is in Africa, it's one ventilator to 1,650,000 1, members of the population, compared to one ventilator to 1,650 people in, in, in the US, for example. So real differences in, in terms of strength of the healthcare system. And if you look at COVID-19 vaccination, one of the key interventions that helped us to control um, COVID, the, in, in Africa, we've seen, we heard that this morning, around 20% of the population fully vaccinated against COVID, as compared to the Middle East, where most countries have more than 90% of the population had three vaccines for, for, for COVID-19. So really two different regions. 
However, the lessons are really clear at national level, at hospital level, and also at individual level, and that's the framework I'm going to use here. So the, the impact um, of the coordinated response for COVID-19 in African countries and in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean area, it's exactly the same. When there is coordinated action with politicians being involved, policymakers, healthcare workers, members of the public working together with a plan, you see a difference in terms of the outcome. And that's what we're seeing all across Africa as well. As you see in this picture here, the president of Rwanda also involved in COVID con um, control. And, and that's the impact that we also need in sepsis involving members of the public, policymakers, politicians, and having national action plans that can, can, can do the same, the same thing. At the healthcare level, we've also seen significant improvements across the board, not where we want it to be in, in these regions, but at, in, at hospital level, where most of us work as clinicians, we've seen improvements in systems to identify and care for patients that are critically ill in terms of um, triage, um, um, I, uh, diagnosis, use of early warning scores, response systems. So we've strengthened systems in hospital to respond to COVID. And there are obvious benefits for other critical illnesses, including um, sepsis. But the approach has been different. It's not one size fit all. So for example, in, in, in African countries, it's been more about strengthening existing health systems whilst in the Middle East, what we saw was more developing COVID facilities, separate COVID facilities to look after patients with COVID-19. Uh, and the focus, I think, has been ex the right focus, is strengthening existing ser um, services in, in Africa so they can deal with any emergency, can deal with any critically uh, ill patients. And I think we need to also, exactly the same message, those lessons are things we need to also do for sepsis. And at individual level, and I'm, fin I'm finishing with this, it really um, amuses me and, and, and it gives me pleasure when I sit with friends um, in social events and hear them talk about COVID-19 vaccination treatment as experts. Uh, everybody has become a COVID uh, expert. And, and, and that is ex where we want to be with sepsis, that people need to know about sepsis. And they've been very innovative means of of raising awareness about sepsis in the Middle East as well in, in Africa. And these are examples from, from some of the countries in, in Africa using really innovative ways of getting people's attention and passing on the message. And I think we used to do, we need to do the same for sepsis. And I'll finish with this because this is a national action plan for Australia and Brett in the morning um, showed this national action plan for, for sepsis. And other countries in Europe have that. Um, I think we've heard, we've heard about the Swedish National Action Plan, and I'm sure the, there's a German action plan. Sepsis, 85% of cases of sepsis are in low and middle income countries. However, we don't yet have a, a country in, a, in the low and middle income country setting with a national action plan. So if we're going to, to be serious about bringing about real change in sepsis globally, we've got to get that traction to happen in areas where sepsis is a significant problem, in Africa, in Asia, in, in um, South America. And so where we want to be is using the lessons from COVID-19 to drive the changes that are needed at large scale, not small scale, large scale improvement at country level. And we do need the national action plans with resources to support it, and also then the action to bring about change. Thank you. Thank you. We now move from Africa to Europe. Professor Evangelos Giamarellos from the National University of Athens is a chair of the European Sepsis Alliance. He will focus on one specific example of clinical research from COVID which might be applicable to sepsis as well. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. You know, when uh, COVID arrived for us who are working in the field of sepsis, it was very easy to recognize that indeed it is sepsis. A similar reaction, more or less, similar principles of reaction. And uh, this led to the thoughts that were, has started more or less to be recognized the last decade before the pandemic that one approach 
in order to treat sepsis would be to modulate the exaggerated immune response of the host. However, because of the failures of similar approaches 30 years ago, most of researchers that around 15, 16, and 17, they were recognizing that we need to move towards the principles of precision medicine. So my thought was that these principles need to adapt to COVID-19. So allow me, I don't know how, oh. Allow me to show you that indeed we managed to succeed that, and not just to manage to have a successful publication, but actually to have a new strategy, which is not just active, but it's also recognized by the European regulatory, by the European Medicines Agency, that indeed a drug of immunotherapy can be used to maximize efficacy when you find a way to identify the patient population where you may have most of efficacy. In COVID-19, this is working. And allow me to show you the principles of how this is working. So these are all patients who are admitted to hospital. They may be phenotypically the same. They may have the same clinical signs, but their disease is not driven by the same mechanism. So the question comes, can we recognize the mechanism? In order to recognize the mechanism, in other terms, to enlighten the patients towards you can deliver a precision treatment, you are in need of a biomarker. And if your biomarker is increased and your biomarker can show you which is the target population, if you start immediate treatment, then you may have a maximal clinical efficacy. Regarding COVID-19, biomarker is SUPAR, which is showing that a patient who's admitted to hospital is under the activation and the early activation of the IL-1 cascade. And for the inhibition, Vial one cascade, there is a drug, the drug is an akindra, it is the recombinant antagonist of the IL1 receptor and blocks the action of both IL1 beta and IL1 alpha. However, from my interaction with the European Medicines Agency, I learned several lessons, which is what we who are active researchers in the field of sepsis need to understand and this may broaden our efficiency and efficacy in the design and results of clinical trials. So, yes, the principle of the trial was that we need to have a standard of care to randomize the patient to placebo treatment and intervention treatment. But what were, were we doing all these years in sepsis? The end point of the clinical trial was always mortality. And when we had interactions with the European Medicines Agency about what the end point for COVID should be, then I realized that a regulatory only about mortality. Mortality is one edge of the problem. The other edge is the quality of life of survivors. And this is something that in sepsis we neglect. And we need to give treatment, not thinking ab only about mortality, about how a patient who will survive will be delivered back to the society. Allow me to tell you, to summarize a bit the results of our Anakinra trial, and what was impressive in the eyes of the regulatory was that patients who were fully recovered were almost three times more if they got treatment. Those who were get rid of long COVID were significantly decreased and of course, there is huge benefits in terms of the reduction of the rate of hospitalization, either in the ward or in the ICU, and of course, of deaths. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was a very specific example, but a specific drug can only work in a hospital setting which is able to really deliver it in the right way. And I think the next speaker, to yeah, Professor Tobias Welte is well placed to tell us about the importance of putting all the different facets of treatment together in a hospital. He's at the Hanover University School of Medicine 
and the director of the Department of Pulmonary and Infectious Diseases, and he's, he's the head of the German Sepsis Foundation. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. I, I do not want to echo what have been said, and I want a little bit more focus on Germany, because I'm from Germany, and I know the German situation at my best, and maybe some of the problems I will focus on are problems worldwide, and everybody can take something from it. If I look to the corona pandemic, I first focus on the patient's perspective. <clears throat> and I think what we learned about corona is, and uh, Mr. Müller-Jung uh, said it perfectly, everything was discussed in the media, that, but to be honest, as a scientist, this was a real disappointment because 90% uh, of what has been published and discussed and even in the public media was partly wrong or totally bullshit. And this is what people take. And what I learned from this is, well, we need a better education of our population. Roman Marek showed the data what people in Germany know about sepsis and it's more or less nothing. So we need to go to school, to the educational system in Germany and in other countries to bring something like healthcare education for the most important diseases for body biology and uh, more into the schools. My second point again is with regard to advertising. Stefan Kaufmann said vaccination is a fantastic preventive measure. And he is right. There's nothing better to prevent infectious disease and I'm sure there will be vaccination for other diseases also. For example, in the oncology field, uh, that's true. But look to the vaccination rates here in Germany. You mentioned pneumococcal vaccination. 8% of those for whom pneumococcal vaccination is recommended are vaccinated. That's terrible. And if you look to other countries, for example, France, there is advertising in public media financed by the government, by politics, to stimulate vaccination programs and vaccination strategy. This is something which is totally missing in Germany. The HRV campaign was mentioned during the morning session. In my mind, this is the best example for success because the HIV campa campaign led to a preventive habit of people which dropped down the infection rate. And the same had to be done for other healthcare issues and for where I'm coming from, mainly in terms of a vaccination advertising campaign. This is a political task. My third topic is education of doctors. Because if you ask doctors what they know about sepsis, it's again terrible and absolutely disappointing. And the reason for this is very historical. If you look to Germany, Germany was the country of infectious diseases. Three Nobel Prizes in the first decade of the last century had been won by Germans. Robert Koch, Paul Ehrlich, Emil von Behring. But for different reasons, one is the involvement of Germany in the First and Second World War, infectious disease wars more or less destroyed in Germany. And after the Second World War, it was not coming up as a special discipline. Infectious disease is, let me say, a horizontal, uh, different disease entities connecting topic. And these had not been placed into the German educational system. 
we, Axel Brie said it, we have no curriculum for infectious disease still in place in 2022 in the German medical education program. We have no special curriculum for sepsis, a disease which is number three in the countrywide mortality statistic. This is awful. And this is something which had to be changed. And the same is true for the education of the doctors after they've finished their exam uh, and for raising their awareness for such a kind of disease. My last point is together with structures. And I'm sure Niels Friedemann will say something to this in his talk. But Germany is a little bit of over-bureaucratic country. And if you look to what happened in the corona pandemic, you see that the big trials and the breakthrough trials had not been made in Germany. This was recovery in the UK, Raymap Cup in the Netherlands, the American networks, which published the big studies in a very fast and nevertheless in teacher manner. Why did it not take place in Germany? Because the numbers of patients, the number of patients in hospital on intensive care had been high. But why were we not successful? And the major reason is we have no system in place. We have no platform for clinical studies. We have no regulation how to deal with a situation like a pandemic. We are much, much, much too slow. And we do have bureaucratic obstacles, bureaucratic hurdles, which avoid to move forward in, a, in view of a pandemic. And this has to be overcome. My last, because time is running, my last sentence, and this has been said by a number of the panelists, is if you want to be successful in medicine and in research, and mainly for a complicated disease like sepsis, you need money. If a government, and Germany is a country in which brain, the development of educated patients, people, uh, is main for the economic, if you do not invest in research, if you do not invest in research in every circumstance, it's bad for the patients, bad for the scientists, but also bad for uh, the development of a country. And this is something which had to be aware in the political arena. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've looked at the countries, we've looked at universities, now we look in the world of biotech startups. With us is Dr. Niels Riedemann, he's CEO of Inflarex, a company which developed a drug which can be used for COVID and might be used for sepsis as well. Thank you. Okay, it's working. Yes, thanks so much for inviting me to speak here. Um, I like to think that we're not really a startup anymore. We uh, IPO'd the company, so we're at the NASDAQ Stock Exchange since 2017, but we're still a very small company. Um, so I, when I uh, thought about what I can share in this session, I, I reflected a little bit about what I did. So it just occurred to me that the last 22 years of my life, I, I spent researching um, um, and treating and then developing um, in sepsis. And um, it's tough. Um, and when COVID came around the corner, we actually as a company um, came back to sepsis in a way, because when we looked at the first patients and we were very connected to some researchers in Wuhan in China, we realized that these patients had through the roof complement activation, which, which we've never seen, which is part of our oldest response system of our immune response against microbes and other disturbances in our blood system. So we knew it was sepsis. And a, a few things I would like to share um, here are, are learnings from what we've just done. We're a very small team, about 50 people in the company, and 
we, we just about completed this year one of the, or actually what we believe is the largest global study, one-to-one um, -one randomized placebo-controlled global study in invasively intubated, um, mechanically ventilated COVID-19 patients. So this, these are the patients that show death rates above 40% at 28 days and higher. And despite a lot of progress and despite the, the blessing of vaccinations and, and the blessing of first therapies to target the virus, unfortunately, we still see patients progressing to what we now know is an immune response driven um, viral sepsis. And um, of course, you do progress, you, you do get uh, m more likely not, not to this status if you're um, vaccinated, and that is good, the good news for the healthy people. But what about the news for those that are unlucky lucky and progress? And so when running the study, which we were happy to get it published last week in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, and which showed uh, um, a 24% relative reduction of death in the global data setting. Um, when we um, conducted the study, we had to run into a few learnings, and I want to share just a few of them with you. But before I do that, I want to also point out something very positive, because it was already kind of uh, mentioned here um, by some of the speakers, um, especially a doc a Dr. Priest here from, from the Charity, which is um, something that uh, I also found amazing. I think we've never seen more increase of in-depth research and knowledge in a field than through this pandemic. And this is something that was really possible because of the driving forces, but also because of collaboration. And it was mentioned before, and also be because information was exchanged fast. At least between the researchers, not always appropriately in the public, Unfortunately, that's a whole lot of different story. But this was something that is a huge opportunity for sepsis research. And this is why I'm happy to speak here today, because um, realizing that what has been done there can be translated to sepsis research is great. Now, it is really important to recognize that not everybody develops a sepsis with COVID, thankfully. But we checked this just because we're working on a submission for emergency use authorization in the US. And just about last week's average was 400 deaths per day, COVID deaths in the US alone. So these patients unfortunately still exist. We are not in a major wave right now and they still die. So a few learnings and one of them is really going out to a general remark that um, leads to something that, that um, Tobias Welte just mentioned that I can only echo we are not pandemically prepared in most countries of the world to run a study even together. And that has to do with regulatory hurdles, mostly. And as, as a little um, story here, for example, when we wanted to start the study also in Germany, um, and the study ran in, in, diff in different continents in different countries worldwide, we actually, uh, um, had a very good engagement with our very scientifically driven um, authorities, regulatory authorities, which is in our case for antibodies, the Paul Ehrlich Institute, it's like the German FDA, if you will. And they really worked overnight at the weekend and they approved us the study within a few days after submission. This is unheard of. This is better than in any other country we went to. But before we could enroll the first patient in Germany, another six months had to pass from there on to get a study site activated. And if this is the case, something must be wrong. Now, Germany is not alone in this problem. That's um, the comforting news, if you want to call it comforting, which <laughs> probably we shouldn't. But the US has shown us that it's possible to enroll whole phase three studies in, six, in those six months. And so um, while you know, I think it's important to recognize that most of the patients that led to the first successful vaccine development by BioNTech, these were not German patients, right? <laughs> they were in South America. And, and it's, but, but I think we should contribute, and we should contribute in the Western countries, and there are things we can learn, and pandemic preparedness, um, for me, also means that we are prepared to run these studies, and that we are making a united effort to move or remove regulatory hurdles 
that are really nothing but blocking to the study start. They're not necessarily all helping to, in, you know, to make sure that the patient is safe or that the study is high quality. And that is something we can all work on, and I don't see many initiatives there. Um, another thing that I would like to share that I think goes to the um, area of collaboration, one thing, frankly, and I'm, I'm being very honest, you know, hopefully I, I'm, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes, it really bothered me that in every TV show, at least in Germany, we always saw virologists. I, I like virologists. I have, I have nothing against virologists. And then after a while, someone thought about maybe we should invite an epidemiologist. Then after a while, someone thought maybe it's good if we also invite um, a pulmonologist, even or intensive care physician, heaven forbid. It, it was not, it didn't seem to me as there was a research council that spoke with one voice, and there was also not a clarity, because one virologist said this, and then the other said that, and everybody got confused. And so we can learn about communication, we can learn about how much you can get achieved if you actually also align the public, because if someone knows their studies and they're important, they may be more likely to give informed consent for such a study. So I think it is all connected, and there we can do a better job. And last but not least, um, um, this is also more of a, a personal learning, and then I stop. And I mentioned that last week on our press conferences, I, I always wondered why is the sad truth that there are so many people dying from sepsis, but there's so little known. And, and Tobias said it perfectly, it's, 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 it's awful, right? And um, the problem may be that you know, when you have HIV or a cancer, this is something that is very close to all of us because you live among us and we see you suffering. Um, but when you have a sepsis, you're transferred to an intensive care unit. Nobody sees you anymore. And people die when they're in the hospital on an intensive care unit. So that's tragic, but it happens. And I do believe that we should really appeal to people's empathy there are a lot of tragedies. These are not all, not all 95 year old people with, uh, or pre-diseased. These, these are tragedies. And, and, and patients that developed this, many of them were also vaccinated. Of course, the majority probably was not. But um, there is a need to also help these people. I know it's just one part of the story and others may be more important. But when you develop actually a drug to help these people, you understand how little is known, how little engagement there is, and how little working together there is. And the, the last sentence, if we didn't have such great nurses, investigators, staff, engaged people that actually work at the patient bedside, researchers, uh, this would have never been possible. It was really personal engagement of individuals. So with that, uh, thank you for letting me share. Thank you. These were quite different perspectives on the topic of COVID and sepsis, but there were several common themes, the importance of research, the focus on getting the patients to the right health facility, to have the health facilities in the first place, and overall communication, which almost everyone mentioned here. I would like to start off with research. One issue with research was that, at least in Germany, Every doctor, every researcher started, what can I do for COVID? Started with their own little trial, but in the end, there were not really useful evidence produced because the trials were too small. So why is it it's so complicated in Germany and in many other countries as well to engage in these common trials like Solidarity, as you mentioned, which really delivered results where doctors could use the information. Axel Pries, maybe you have a take on this. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a question of organization in the country. We, we don't have a proper, or we didn't have a proper structure to align it. Later on, the university network was established, and I think that that's going into the right direction to, to exchange competition by cooperation uh, for these large questions. Um, the mindset had to change, and I think that could be used in the future. And the second thing is local regulatory differences. It's very, very difficult in Germany because of the federal structure uh, to create something like that, whereas in the NHS 
you have a central data bank and so on and so forth and you can do this stuff. So, so we, have to, uh, we have to develop, despite federal systems, we have to develop a way to interact and that's also a European problem because Europe is obviously federal, so we have to solve the problem. But, but it's also a money problem. That's, that, that's always the same. And uh, I think one of the misunderstandings for a very long time in Germany and most of the countries I know uh, had this misunderstanding is that the costs for a clinical trial uh, are underestimated. So if you want to bring, Stefan knows it very well, if you want to bring uh, a new drug in a phase three study into the market, this is a 100 million investment. And when the grants are 1.5 million, uh, that, that's absolutely not enough to proceed. So th this is something which was very lately understood in Germany. It's much better now, but we, we have to bring it into uh, an institutional structured form of how uh, to support trials in, in view of, for example, a pandemic. And the next pandemic will come. So Corona is only a start. It's probably not very much to add. And um, I just want to say that it's also a, a certain natural cause, for, at least for the vaccine field. You go there where the disease is most frequent. I mean, COVID was then coming, and that's a different issue. But currently, um, um, at first, as you said it, the price is just higher in Germany than in many other countries. And um, to make that also clear, if one goes to Africa, one does it in Africa with the Africans. I'm not want to be misunderstood. We did that with Gates money, uh, where we built up uh, infrastructure. And, and, and I want just to add that Germany often forgets that it's not just a project, it's not just positions, it is infrastructure that you have to develop. And I would claim that in South Africa, infrastructure currently for certain vaccines are better than in, much better, uh, to make it clear, much, much better than in Germany. Uh, uh, so there is also a natural reason, namely um, infectious diseases on overall are lower than in other countries, not, uh, not to be generalizing, but in often, and, and that is a reason, and Germany just was not ready. As I said, I, I remember very well when I was told by German sponsors, we are not sponsoring money in, uh, outside of Germany. Um, this money is taxpayers' money for Germany. That's wrong. It has changed slightly, but the Americans, uh, the US, had seen that much earlier. I, th I think the main sentence is global yes. and, and you only can fight infectious disease globally yes. and this must include low-income countries, uh, middle-income countries and the rich countries and we said it several times, only worldwide collaboration will help to fight pandemics. Well, uh, I fully agree with what was mentioned but uh, I have also to add that uh, the paradigm I uh, mentioned to you regarding the precision medicine has now moved and it's something which is already taking place through a, a large European collaboration where patients who are with sepsis, with bacterial sepsis in the ICU, they receive precision treatment and this is a trial which is funded by the European Union which is taking place in Germany. In Germany it's taking place in the University of Vienna. It's taking place in two uh, cities in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, in Italy, and in Greece. So uh, I believe that this is a prototype example of how the benefits coming from the research of COVID-19, the teachings of the way to follow, are really helping us. And if indeed, with this precision approach, we target 30% of the patients at septic shock with specific uh, immune uh, either exacerbations or immune dysfunctions. If this turns out to be positive, then I hope that this may lead to a change on how we need to think and how to uh, manage our patients in the ICU. When you look at the situation in Africa, Emmanuel and Sutibu, when these 
high, highly complex medicines which have to, where the patients have to be tested before the medicine can be given. Is this what you need for Africa or do you need other types of research to deliver other types of interventions which might not take place at an intensive care unit but might take place at a health center? Um, that's a really important question and um, the sepsis in Africa in, in other parts of the world is very different from sepsis in Europe. Um, I've, I've worked in the UK, I was working in the UK before I moved to the UAE um, and worked in Africa. The population is different. I mentioned the population is younger, is also HIV, high prevalence, um, there's also issues with malnutrition, etc. Et so the, the host is different. The pathogens that cause sepsis is also quite different in Africa with um, reports of, of more of t tuberculosis being a significant cause of sepsis in Africa, especially in high endemic areas for HIV, malaria, zoonosis being also causes of sepsis, more so than, than in, in Europe. So the pathogens are different, the hosts are different, and even the host response. So we, we've had trials um, in Africa for flu resuscitation. Um, coming up with quite surprising results the, um, in, in children as well as in adults um, with higher mortality with bolus fluid resuscitation in Africa. Maybe um, driven by malaria, we, we don't really know. But the reason why I'm going through all this is, is that as we do research for Africa and similar to what was supposed to be done for COVID, we need to make sure that um, there, are, there are African countries and, and sites involved um, because we cannot just transpose research that has happened in Europe or in America to, to, to Africa. Um, you, you, get, you, you either get conflicting results or you get adverse uh, outcomes. So we need African solutions to, to this. That also involves building the infrastructure for research in Africa. South Africa has a really strong research um, infrastructure and epidemiological uh, structure. So um, when the Omicron uh, um, surge happened, it appeared to come from Africa because of the strength of surveillance in South Africa. Um, it was happening in other parts of Europe and other parts of the world, but it was because of the strength of, of, of the network for surveillance of Africa that was picked up really, really early. Um, so we do need to, to, to strengthen, and that's the reason why for the African Sepsis Alliance, a lot of the work that we're doing is on the back of research, and a lot of the change that we're bringing about is on the back of research with the African Research Collaboration on Sepsis, and other um, research projects that we're, we're hoping to set up. And that will um, set up the infrastructure to answer some of the questions that are relevant for Africa, so we have solutions that are local, but also in future, if there are studies that have need to be done, multi-center international studies, then we have sites in Africa that can also run those, those trials in, with, 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 um, with, with people in, in other parts of the world. Uri Eggers, I would like to ask you, We've now talked a lot about the research things. You talked about the really basic stuff, water in a health facility. So is COVID, did COVID help in raising the awareness for these problems so that they can be better approached now? During the COVID uh, epidemic, I was actually based in Kenya, so it was very interesting to see that uh, the effects of the COVID pandemic was very much a reinvigoration of basic health services, of the ability to do basic work at health facility level. Uh, that being said, we've heard about the constraints in Germany for research, for collaboration among researchers, and this is really where I think um, maybe the global perspective, you mentioned the global perspective of infectious disease, is really that should be maybe the lesson out of the COVID pandemic. We had huge difficulties in Kenya to just access research collaboration for COVID. So the ability to access the solidarity trials of WHO, access basic funds just for a principal investigator was a huge challenge. So I agree with you, we have started on that road. I think collaboration has become a lot better, a lot better than what it was before. The scaring up that we uh, experienced has been a lot better than, than before. But in Africa, we need to, in the 
inter-pandemic period, in the period until the next pandemic strikes. We need to create that infrastructure, the research infrastructure, the health facility infrastructure, and just basic hygiene, as I started off saying. So I think across the board, uh, I would say that the, uh, the, the, the challenge of COVID or, or the, the lessons that we learned from COVID is we have to respond globally and equity is really, really important in this. We cannot leave behind some countries hoping that everybody else will be okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to come back to the issue of communication. So it's important to communicate with the public so that they know what the signs of sepsis are. This is true for Africa, that's true for Germany as well. So what can journalists like you and I do to get the get our editors to publish our articles on sepsis? Yeah, okay, that's a question of, of money, of course. <laughs> it's also a question of money, of course, but we need, the, we need the money for research, of course. I would agree. Uh, the point is, we heard this morning and, and during the afternoon often uh, the word awareness building. We need awareness building, and, and every, everything you mentioned is right. Maybe the operational problems you have, maybe the communication problems, the, the internal communication problems, or the, 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 the failure to, to get a lot of money, to, to get the money you need. But of course, you, you won't get the money if you don't get the politicians aware of your problems. So my, my suggestion for, for uh, sepsis researchers uh, and maybe for the alliance also, is of course to be more aggressive. Of course, we learned during this COVID crisis this, that the long COVID community, which is now uh, attached to the, to the chronic fatigue uh, community, which is getting more aggressive, they now demonstrate in front of, uh, of uh, uh, the buildings, uh, of government buildings, actually. They, 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 so you have to be more aggressive, and we, of course, as, as, as media, we can present platforms, we can give you room, we can give you space, we can give you the opportunity, but of course you have to argue on these, on these platforms. You have to communicate, and communicate in a manner which is, and that is also a lesson from COVID, which is not just right and precise, which is also popular enough and which of course can be discussed in in the in the public sphere a lot of researchers are very yeah they ha they got problems of course uh, one third of the of the of the researchers which were asked for this survey uh, they had really negative experiences having communicated with the public they got aggressive reactions uh, and we have a lot of German uh, examples of that. Uh, of course, it is, it is really hard to communicate as a researcher, but it is necessary. And I would say we can, especially in this new era of, of uh, electronic communication, digital communication, we have platforms, we, we, have, we, we don't need these constraints which are a problem when you just print newspapers. Of course, we now have platforms big enough. We can really uh, try to popularize subjects and subjects like sepsis, which is so important, not just, we heard this morning a lot of examples, why, why is it so, so important? And the, and the numbers everybody knows here. So I would say this is a case where the obvious reason to, to be more aggressive, and to be more offensive as a researcher and research communicator is, is, is a priority, is a priority. It's not just marketing campaigns. We heard about wonderful marketing campaigns. Uh, that is one, one aspect, advertisements and so on. These are good, good uh, trials, but uh, of course, most enough is interactive communication. And I guess uh, we have the responsibility to, to, to moderate those communications also. Uh, of course, we are gatekeepers, but the researchers, they should be sentinels, I would say. They should be sentinels for the crisis, and the sepsis crisis is not smaller than the COVID crisis. So they should try to 
communicate more aggressively. Axel Fries. Yeah, yeah, um, good, good challenge, but it's uh, not so easy, and you have to look at the reasons why it's not happening. In cancer, they have the zero cancer vision, and every one knows uh, what they talk about. In sepsis, if you talk to your family, they say, what's that? And uh, um, that's, that's a real problem. And the other problem is that, that people die in the hospital. So you don't have the patient advocate groups. They are very strong in, in cancer. They are less strong in cardiovascular, which is also not driven by, by mortality or morbidity, but rather by, by fear and by, by the perception. And I think for, for sepsis, there's, a, there's a really a, a lack of perception of what it is. And uh, so the, 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 if the researchers go um, <clears throat> to the politicians and say it has to be done, uh, there's the uh, automatic reflex that the researchers want money for their research, like everyone in research, because that's what we do and we need money to do it. But we need uh, independent people, like patient groups and, and others, to support that. And in, in sepsis, that's very difficult. It can be done with sepsis survivors, which is an increasing group. It can be done with uh, relatives. Um, but I think um, if you want to do it, you have to really look into the mechanisms which, which create sepsis such a black hole in, in the notion both among medics, uh, I mean, in, in our curriculum, you said that, and even more in the public. And this uh, mismatch of the real danger and the reaction is really stunning. And we have to analyze it. The, the media cannot do that. They, they can just be the uh, amplifier for what we are doing. But we have to analyze the reasons and then address the reasons. One last word by Niels yeah. Riedemann. Yeah, uh, to, to this topic. Um, very short anecdotal question. During the pandemic, I spoke with, uh, with the person um, in the Ministry of Education and, and, and Science, um, trying to convince them that it's very important not to just put grants out for vaccines, but also for treatments, including long COVID, but just treatments. And the answer was, yeah, maybe, maybe not, maybe. Uh, but you should really create more pressure through the press if you want us to move. I was very shocked because I said, then I, then, we just tell you what you should fund after I talk to the press. Um, but what I learned, and that's my point here, yeah, I was very shocked about this, to be honest. But what I really learned is we all have an agenda. I'm, as a CEO of a biotech company, already many people of you will think, oh, the guy's only about money. This is a prejudice, and people assume it's my agenda. Uh, I'm, I'm a big believer that uh, people should put their conflicts out, and it should be on the table for everyone. But journalists don't put their conflicts of interest out. Researchers rarely do it, unless they get money from the bad industry. That's a conflict. But we all have an agenda. And that's legitimate. It's, not, it's nothing bad. It's just bad if we let it get in the way of our judgment. And if we can align an agenda, if we agree that we want to lower sepsis mortality or create awareness, if we all, media, researchers, scientists, developers, if we all say this is what we want, if we align on the agenda, then we can speak more freely. And, and this is really something that I saw here and there happening in COVID. And I think if we can get this done, we can get done a lot. Thank you. This, this was a good last word for this session. I think we covered a lot, research, communication, the health system in different countries. And it all boils down there are many areas where movement was initiated in the field of COVID where sepsis can try to ride on the momentum and get things done, as you said. And I hope you all were able to do this with this conference as well. Thank you.